So thanks everyone for joining our webinar. Our energy experts will work to make this useful and insightful for you. This webinar is drawn from our Scott Madden Energy Industry Update. We recently released it to over 10,000 industry leaders. Thanks to those of you from whom we've already heard and those who have invited us to facilitate discussions with their senior leadership teams and their boards. If you have joined us for these webinars before, or if you read the update, you know we always like to have a theme. Our clients inspired this one. It is exciting to see our industry turn challenges into opportunity. We're seeing new ways to generate electricity, new ways to generate ideas and innovation, and a new generation of leaders emerging in the industry. So we have themed the issue generation to generation, an industry evolution. Today's webcast cannot cover everything in the update, for that, you'll have to click the link at the end of this deck or visit our website. The price is free. The price is right. It's free. For the webinar, though, we've chosen three topic areas that we thought would be interesting to you. First, Kristen Lyons, partner and our grid transformation practice leader, is going to talk about grid investment, not the same old wires. She'll talk about grid modernization and investment and distribution. She'll talk about transmission investment, the current and the changing drivers. And she'll also talk about how the interplay between transmission and distribution may change. Next, Paul Quinlan, our clean tech manager, will talk about smart utility scale solar. So could solar change from duck curve problem child, the thing that messes up the grid, to gold star grid citizen? Paul will talk about what we call the solar trifecta. What are the three things that could get us from here? Last, I'll try and cut through the clutter on competition at the crossroads. The wholesale market issues and a variety of perspectives on them are in the trades every day. But what are the underlying fundamentals? And lastly, with some help from Greg Litra, we'll field questions. So, Kristen, what's up with grid investment? Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as you mentioned, I'm going to focus on grid investment and some of the trends that we're seeing across grid modernization for distribution and what's happening in transmission. Next slide, please. I'm going to start off with the distribution side of the discussion. So at the moment, grid modernization is receiving a tremendous amount of attention. Um, we're seeing utilities and various jurisdictions put forth proposals to modernize the grid. means at the moment. In fact, I'm working with some clients at the moment to actually define that process. But a few things are emerging. On the policy side, we're seeing business model reform, rate reform, and market access all show up as potential themes. And these candidly vary very much from state to state. Um, on the physical side, what we're talking about is really upgrading the TND system to increase automation, Generally, it includes AMI, so we're seeing an emergence of focus on the customer, um, granting them more access to data. In some cases, we're seeing this include microgrids. So a lot of different resources are showing up based on state or utility priorities. Um, we recently published a case study um, that I think is a really good example of what we think grid modernization should include. And, and for jurisdictions that are not Illinois, we hold it out as an example of, of one to pay attention to. So recently we published a study with SEPA um, that was entitled, DERs are coming and Illinois is ready. And what we wanted to convey was the process that Illinois went through starting in the early 2010s um, with the Energy Infrastructure Modernization Act to really upgrade the grid and um, create a construct that facilitated utility investment and focus on the customer. So in 2011, the Energy Infrastructure Modernization Act funded significant upgrades to T&D. It was roughly $3.2 billion across um, ComEd and Ameren. The infrastructure that was um, funded through this included everything from your traditional upgrades of the wire side of the business to AMI, distribution automation, and importantly, it included the IT and telecommunications underpinnings that facilitated enhanced monitoring and control of the assets that are out on the system. What's unique about the way Illinois went about this is the fact that they were very constructive in the way they thought about rate making 
um, and what the utilities needed to provide these in, um, to invest in the system and um, have visibility to, to have line of sight to what they were going to earn. So that's a long way of saying Illinois put in place both performance-based rate making and formulaic rate making. So on the performance side, they tied investments under EMA to improvements in safety and safety, reliability metrics that had a direct impact on their customers, as well as um, reducing the number of estimated bills on the AMI side. So again, the cu customers have seen a very direct benefit from the investments that were made. Um, in addition, Illinois instituted formulaic rate making, so utilities had a direct line of sight to what they had invested, to what they would be able to recover. And they tied those ROEs to 30-year treasuries plus 580 basis points. And th that could be adjusted based on their performance against the metrics I just mentioned. So again, that created both the physical infrastructure and a tie to customer benefits for the entire program. So in 2016, um, the legislature passed the Future Energy Jobs Act, which further built on this foundation. So this act actually focused on additional renewables in state, um, driving wind and solar, and it created carve-outs for distributed energy resources. So we saw solar specifically carved out for um, distributed generation rooftop. So what we're starting to see is Illinois did a great job of putting the foundation in place and they have a grid that's going to be much better positioned to accommodate and integrate these resources. Um, and now they have the mandates to go forward and implement them. On the rate making side, the FIJA also um, further evolved the rate construct and now the utilities in state can treat energy efficiency and certainly certain DER-related rebates as regulatory assets on which they can earn a return. So again, further advancing the discussion. So again, if, if you ask us, we would say Illinois is a, a very good example that other states can look to as they consider grid modernization programs that in our view get many of the right incentives for utilities and customers. Next slide, please. So this graphically illustrates some of the places that we're seeing grid modernization activities. Um, across the U.S., we're seeing everything from AMI, smart grid technologies, specific mandates related to storage and microgrids. And from everything that we're hearing in the market, this map is only going to get more complex and more interesting in the years to come. Um, if the jurisdictions aren't doing the work and forcing utilities to consider grid modernization. The utilities are coming to the commissions with proposals for how they want to invest in making the grid reliable, resilient, and better able to accommodate um, a, an ever-increasingly diverse mix of resources. Next slide, please. So that was a very brief view of what's happening on the distribution side. Um, moving to transmission, so for, for those of you that have been watching this um, industry for a while, you're bound to know that over the last 15 years, we have seen tremendous investment on the transmission side. Um, you know, it, we started in, I guess, 2007, 2008 with um, Order 679, which focused on providing transmission incentives and enhanced ROEs to really drive investment into this sector. And that was the result. We saw a tremendous amount of investment in transmission. And all along, it's been a challenging process to get transmission built, but I think it's safe to say that we're seeing more drivers and more restraining forces than ever before. So certainly we need ongoing investment in this part of the business to meet reliability needs and address intermittency that's introduced by, again, an increasingly diverse resource mix on the bulk power system. The, the infrastructure that's out there continues to age, notwithstanding the level of investment we've seen to date. Um, and we're hearing more and more about resiliency and storm hardening. So on one side of the of the page, you've got a, a really strong case where we need a great backbone system to manage the intermittency that's showing up. We need to continue to invest. The other side of the page, there, there is a view of the world that suggests that we have declining demand growth, we have the ability to manage peaks through demand response and energy efficiency, and man, we don't need to build any more transmission. Um, 
I'll, I'll share later where I personally come down on this. Um, but I think what we're seeing is the we've had a lot of drivers for transmission investment to date, even though it's been hard. The restraining forces are coming to the fore, and things like siting and permitting are getting ever more difficult. So, for instance, um, we're seeing stakeholders in transmission siting cases or even FERC cases forum shop to address issues where the given agency doesn't necessarily have jurisdiction, um, but they're protesting there nonetheless. And we're seeing those, those particular um, protests get a lot of airtime. We're also seeing the financials change. ROEs are declining, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. And lastly, and while, while FERC Order 1000 is, itself is not a restraining force, I think many in the industry really um, hung hope on that order that we would see a lot more investment by third parties and a lot more competition, and, and really that has not materialized. Next slide, please. So to remind everyone of where we've come from, um, as I said, we've been in the middle of a, about a 15-year run in transmission, and the chart on the right shows that every couple of years we think it's going to going to end a few years out. And at the moment, the peak is shown for transmission investment in 2018. We will see if that actually happens. Um, but again, the investment in the sector has been very robust and, and the drivers remain. Um, as I talked about, congestion relief is another area that I didn't mention, but we are seeing wholesale markets really depend on the transmission grid to keep wholesale prices down. Um, the need to continue to con to interconnect large-scale generation, notwithstanding the proliferation of DERs, remains. Um, our system has not yet moved to one that is entirely dependent on local generation, and transmission is what enables um, the vast majority of power delivery today. Next slide, please. So as we think about the way the system is changing, so we have typically had a source to sync model. Central station generation, big wires to little wires to the home. And what that enabled was a very straightforward planning process. We focused on building the transmission system to meet, meet peak. We focused on N minus two contingencies. Um, we focused on things like line loadings. We worried a lot about vegetation management. Um, and we assumed that the system was very redundant. And, and candidly, it was not nearly as complex as it's evolving to be. Um, one of the things that, that's actually similar to what we saw with wholesale deregulation is that as we came out of wholesale deregulation, the transmission system was asked to do things that it had never been asked to do before, ship power across state lines, ship power across the country. Now we're again asking the transmission system to facilitate resources in places um, and at sizes that we didn't anticipate when we originally built the assets. We're seeing things like intermittency and the duck curve, um, which has huge implications for the way you manage the grid. Um, we have less and less fuel diversity. While we have renewables showing up and we have DER showing up, we have less and less diversity from um, the fossil fuel perspective and a lot more gas showing up. Um, cybersecurity is growing ever more important. Um, and as much as the industry over the last 15 years has attempted to has attempted to draw what I would call a bright white line between your transmission and distribution resources through NERC requirements, through um, we've seen a lot of separation of entire energy, what used to be the energy delivery business is now T&D, um, and those control centers have been separate, the, the systems have been planned very separately. That is all changing yet again. Um, so as we see more and more resources show up on the distribution side of the equation, transmission owners and operators now need visibility into what's happening as these resources are aggregated, as they're being bid into wholesale markets. Um, and again, California is certainly leading the charge there. So what we're seeing is a grid that's being asked to do very different things. And what I would suggest um, is two things. First, the, the pace of change across the country varies tremendously state to state. Um, so there are states that are seeing tremendous numbers of resources on the distribution side of, the, of that divide I mentioned, there are many states that aren't. Um, so the central station generation model remains, um, again, a huge part of the way we deliver our energy. Um, but we are seeing the need to look across to the other side to address the issues I, I mentioned, because that is the ghost of Christmas future in many markets. Okay. So moving on to the next slide, please. 
another item that we really need to consider as we think about um, transmission investment going forward is, you know, Order 679, which granted transmission incentives, drove a tremendous amount of investment, um, and and all the incentives were aligned. We we had underspent in transmission for many years, and then we saw a huge buildup in transmission, which has been very good for the system and addressing many of the issues that I mentioned. However, what we're seeing now is ROEs coming back down, and the median is much lower than it was, and we're starting to see it move toward par with what we're seeing in state jurisdictions for distribution. And that has a couple of important implications. Um, from a FERC Order 1000 perspective, um, part of what was going to draw new entrants and competitions as part of the industry was high ROEs, and those are starting to those have declined. They're not starting to. Um, and then for companies that own both T and D, we now have a competition from a financial perspective for who gets the money. And as I mentioned before, grid modernization is getting a tremendous amount of, of attention and state jurisdictions are funding those investments. So um, we're facing a time, next slide please, where everyone's hands will be out with very good reason. Um, We've got the need for grid modernization. We have a need for a, a resilient and reliable backbone system. We have DERs that are showing up on the system that are going to require enhancements to the grid. Um, so the question is, what does all this mean? Um, we need to be very cognizant of this competition for capital and make sure that we allocate appropriately. Um, but I would also suggest that in the same way that a reliable backbone system is critical for managing a diverse resource mix at transmission, the same is going to be true for distribution. And we need to make sure that reliability and resiliency are incented at both levels. And with that, I will turn it back to our moderator. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen. Paul, so next slide, Paul. We all know that solar is good for the environment. But as utility scale solar penetrates, it can be a little challenging for the grid due to the duck curve, riding it down and riding it back up and uh, having supply demand issues at noon. So could this change? And if it could, what would it take and how would we get there? Thank you, Stuart. I'm very happy to be here to talk about a new concept we're calling the solar trifecta. And I think it addresses the, the comments you just made is that we could see a different type of resource on the grid in the future. Uh, the solar trifecta represents three market requirements that, if met, could allow utility-scale solar to function more like dispatch traditional dispatchable resources. And throughout this talk here, uh, all my references to solar will be referring to utility-scale and not looking at uh, distributed solar resources. So before we go more into more detail with that, let's start where we are today. Next slide, please. And we'll walk through the, the pathway of how we could get to uh, smart utility scale solar. So backing up to where we're at today, we will call this what we have today as traditional utility scale solar. And there's a couple key design elements that exist with traditional uh, utility scale solar. First off, they are typically standalone PV systems without battery storage. They're oriented towards the south to maximize production. And they typically their PPAs will have energy only, will be energy only contracts. So they're, they're their output is maximized at all times, and they're delivering that output to the grid in real time whenever they can. Um, some of these systems may provide dynamic voltage and power factor reg regulations based on bulk power system interconnection requirements, but many, if not the majority of existing systems in the U.S. probably are not providing these resources and grid uh, reliability services today. So it's not probably no surprise to folks on the phone, traditional utility scale solar can create several operational challenges. Uh, most notable variable output. So even on a, uh, a day with passing clouds, there can be a lot of variation in the output coming out of a solar system. Uh, there's also a lack of robust ancillary services. So uh, as I mentioned, many systems are not providing grid reliability services. It is not necessarily because it's not technically possible. Uh, it's more of a function of uh, PPA contracts or market rules. There's either no requirement or no compensation to provide those services in many, if not most, markets in, in the United States at this time. And then 
thirdly, there's also dispatch limitations that exist with traditional utility scale solar. And so if you think of the duck curve, solar is unavailable to meet the peak net load that occurs in the early evening. And as a result, uh, typically flexible natural gas generation has to come on and ramp very, very quickly to meet that load as solar begins to come off the system in the evening. What's maybe noteworthy here is that traditional utility scale solar, uh, these operational issues will compound as you reach higher penetrations of solar. So uh, in regions or markets where there's very little solar, it may not be much of an issue, but as more and more gets added, uh, these issues become compounded. So to, to, to address the operational challenges, many have pointed to an answer of pairing solar with natural gas. That seems to be a common and stock answer in many places. Natural gas in this instance would be able to ramp up, ramp down, and kind of be a, a counterparty to solar throughout the day. What we're seeing and, and looking at now is that there, there could be an option for solar to solve many of these problems themselves, become both more controllable, more smarter, and provide greater value to the electric grid. So next slide, please. And what this shows here is kind of the next iteration of solar, and what we call this is controllable utility scale solar. Again, this would consist of a utility scale TV system, but at this time it would leverage smart inverters and operating intelligence to trade energy output for smoother output and grid reliability services. And there's maybe three that are, are worth noting here. First, a controllable system may add additional panels and oversize the system and then throttle back production. If it did this, what would happen is if a if a cloud, that same cloud was passing over the system, if it was originally operating at 90% of potential capacity, blocks of inverters could ramp up and ultimately smooth out the net output from the system. So from a from the system view, uh, the, the electric system, the output from the solar system stays roughly the same and doesn't and mitigates the extreme variation variable output that would be seen from traditional solar. Second, there could also be targeted curtailments. You think about the steep ramp at the end of the day in the duck curve, uh, some of that solar could become curtailed uh, over time to mitigate and soften that ramp that occurs late in the afternoon. And then third, solar could provide a broader suite of reliability services. That so was mentioned dynamic voltage and power factor regulations earlier, but also regulation both up and down and frequency response are capabilities that could be offered by controllable solar. And finally, as part of this definition of controllable solar, it must be cost competitive with new natural gas generation. Next slide, please. And controllable solar gets a stepping stone towards what we're calling smart utility scale solar. And smart utility scale solar is slightly different. This is solar PV plus now battery storage. And because of this, uh, smart utility scale solar is capable of offering the same benefits as controllable solar, but now can also provide energy and capacity during evening and nighttime periods. And again, by definition, we would consider this to be cost competitive with new uh, natural gas generation or other alternative resources. So with these enhanced operational benefits, smart utility scale solar can be dynamic and also a desired grid asset rather than a growing challenge if we were to keep adding traditional utility scale solar at high penetrations. Further, if we think about this, the system can be open, the solar system can be optimized for the grid and not just for maximum output to, to benefit the system itself. Next slide, please. So the pathway to utility scale solar is through something that we call the solar trifecta. And the solar trifecta is the convergence of three market requirements that would allow smart utility scale solar to enter and compete in the market. And the first plank of the solar trifecta is what we call good grid citizenship. And so this is many of the elements that we talked about in controllable solar. Um, in this instance, the solar system would perform new functions and provide new grid services that overall improve stability and reliability of the electric grid. Transitioning from traditional solar to controllable solar would allow solar to become this good grid citizen. We'd have more predictable output, a broad suite of ancillary services and targeted curtailments. And I had mentioned that this is not a, a technical issue, but more of a, a PPA or market rules issue or compensation issue. There, there have been three uh, examples or demonstration projects to date that have shown that solar is capable of delivering many of these services. In 2014 and 2015, there was a demonstration project in Texas where balancing energy services and reserve energy service, dynamic voltage and power factor regulation was demonstrated. Uh, that demonstration was followed by one in Puerto Rico where frequency regulation and also fast 
inertia-like frequent re response was tested and proven that solar can deliver those systems. And more recently, last year in 2016, there was a very large uh, demonstration project conducted by First Solar, NREL, and the California ISO. And in this instance, they took a, a 300 megawatt solar system and tested a, a host of different advanced inverter functions. They also tested a, a plant control feature and demonstrated a wide range of reliability services that, that demonstrated that solar is capable of providing these, these resources. And in one instance, in higher, um, in, in the regulation component that they tested, the, the solar system turned out to be more accurate than even traditional generations in that, that spectrum. And so this is now has California taking a closer look, that, that demonstration project has California taking a closer look at what, what solar may be able to provide in terms of grid services on the system. Next slide, please. The second plank of the solar trifecta is what we call energy when you need it. By exporting all available generation in real time, traditional solar is unable to meet evening or nighttime load. But by adding the storage, solar can then address this challenge and provide energy and capacity at various times when needed. And the way to think about this is if you had a 100 megawatt system, possibly half of that could be used to deliver electricity to the grid, but any surplus above that during the day could be used to charge the battery on the system. And then as the evening comes, that battery could ramp up and actually start discharging. And over the course of uh, longer hours, you would have steady output being delivered to the electric grid. There is, um, the potential for this has been modeled by First Solar recently. They, they took a 100 megawatt system in the Southwest and modeled the hourly output over 20 years. And in the analysis they did, they had a targeted time period they were looking to deliver energy. And it was from 3 p.m. to 7 p.m. in the months that ran from ap April to October. And they did this both with a standalone system and then a PV plus storage system. And the standalone system in that targeted window that they had, the, the overall capacity factor in that target window was 50%. When they added the storage to this system over the 20 years life of the system, the capacity factor in that window jumped to 98%. And so if the, the electric grid can, can indicate or communicate where the, the energy or capacity is needed, solar systems can be designed to deliver and meet those needs and support the grid. And take that a step further, that can be done through a couple different ways. If you think about the, the, the increasing panels on the system or the battery capacity or the battery discharge, there's a number of variables on a solar system that could be um, designed in a way to meet specific needs for the grid. Next slide, please. So the final plank of the solar trifecta is cost competitive resources. And this would apply to both solar systems and also battery storage. It was uh, earlier this year that for utility scale solar systems, the install cost dropped a dollar per watt DC. And there's been a 37% decline since 2015 overall. So we've seen solar as a standalone resource become competitive in several regions throughout the US, the US uh, and costs are continued to, are expected to continue to decline going forward. And in terms of batteries, Battery storage packs have declined 73% from 2000 to 2016. Um, Lazard also released their annual uh, assessments of renewable and storage resources yesterday, and they forecast a decline as much as 36% over the next five years for lithium ion uh, capital costs. So we expect more costs to drop there. When you put those two together, you get the, the PV plus storage system, and there's a notable PPA price point that came, came online earlier this year. In May of this year, Tucson Electric Power signed a PPA for less than four and a half cents per kilowatt hour for a PV plus storage system uh, in the state of Arizona. So that gives some indicator of how these projects might be priced going forward. Um, and ultimately continuing this decline in technology costs will be a key driver for these systems to be able to compete into the future. Next slide, please. And so when you put these three planks of the solar trifecta together, this is where we see smart solar coming into play. They're able to address the constraints of traditional utility scale solar and advance the deployment of smart utility scale solar going forward. Next slide, please. There's some final thoughts on utility, smart utility scale solar. Um, 
one important one is we talk about this as a pathway to smart solar. As the table on this slide shows, smart utility scale solar require advancements with, within all three planks. We need to have the value from being a good grid citizen, we need to have storage to make sure there's energy when you need it, and then co costs have to come down so it's a cost competitive resource. What's noteworthy here is that controllable solar is a logical stepping stone along the way. Um, Value from grid citizenship could be delivered because uh, that is not a technical issue. And then uh, we don't have the battery storage costs associated uh, with smart solar. So there's potential to see controllable solar becoming uh, more prevalent in the very near future. And then behind that smart solar emerging into the marketplace as well. And finally, some of the signposts to watch as, as utility scale solar undergoes this transition. The first one is uh, recognition of good grid citizenship. Where we think that will happen is in changes to PPA contracts, changes to market rules. And so that's an area to watch to see if there's recognition um, or a requirement or compensation for these grid reliability services to, um, from solar to be delivered to the grid. Second then is success of early uh, PV plus storage systems. Uh, there's also, in addition to the contract signed in, in Arizona, there's two systems that have been or are being developed in Hawaii. And those systems in Hawaii are being designed to deliver uh, energy in the evening hours. So watching how those systems perform and whether they perform as expected will be an important indicator of how PV plus storage will do going into the future. And then finally, a continued learning curve effects. So we are expecting continued cost declines in solar PV and also battery storage, and it will be important for those cost declines to continue in order for smart utility scale solar to become cost competitive in the future. So with that, I'll turn it back to Stuart and look forward to questions later. Thank you, Paul. Important topic with the expected growth of utility scale solar, not, not just in California and, uh, and the Southwest. So I'll talk about competition at the crossroads. What, what is going on with wholesale electricity markets? Next slide, please. For the answer to that question, where you stand depends on where you sit. You'll hear widely differing comments from those charged with regulating and running the markets, from those whose plants are being threatened by today's economics, and from states who have their own public policy objectives, and a newish player to the scrum, Rick Perry's DOE. So far, the problem has evaded a simple solution. Least cost marginal dispatch does not necessarily ensure returns to capital and of capital if you've got long-lived expensive assets. This has been called the so-called, uh, this has been called the missing money problem, uh, and it's been on the radar for at least a decade. Capacity markets were something that we did that were supposed to solve it, but, but have they? So, so if the problem isn't new, what, what is new? Well, for one thing, there is an increasing amount of out-of-market mechanisms, uh, and to some degree, these are taking new forms like zero emissions credits. So the question becomes, is there enough of this out-of-market stuff to reach a tipping point for price formation, meaning that what we're doing changes the outcomes for other players? So why are the out-of-market mechanisms happening so much now? Well, states want different things than what the wholesale markets were originally designed to provide. And in the old days, when gas prices were high and demand was growing, the pie kept getting bigger, and it was easier to accommodate differing interests in a win-win fashion um, with all that money. But now there's decreasing alignment between state and federal interests, especially around stuff like resource mix attributes and also around things like social goods. So we think it helps to just go back to fundamentals and frame this problem from the lens of our econ class and think about it as both a macro and a micro problem in economics. Next slide, please. So, so let's look at the macro. When we formed the markets, the theory went like this. Generation is not a natural monopoly. So I didn't like TND, which is a natural monopoly. So we're going to take generation, we're going to put it in a commodity market construct, and buyers and sellers will then be free to make choices in response to their price signals, and voila, the invisible hand of Adam Smith uh, is going to drive price down to cost, where long-run marginal cost equals long-run marginal revenue, 
and prices would go down and we'll have plenty of generation. Sounds great, right? Kind of like tastes great, less filling. So that was the theory. But as Yogi Berra says, in theory, there's no difference between theory and practice, but in practice there is. So there are three differences we're seeing between theory and practice. Well, one is in full markets, when buyers and sellers make choices, prices don't just go down, they go up. Prices can spike. Second, in full markets, we can have stockouts. There might be a price at which nobody wants to supply. We could run out. So we didn't want to have prices spike. We didn't want to have stockouts. And a response to that led to the third problem. To prevent these things, we put in these administrative overlays, caps, floors, minimum offer prices, price rules, administratively determined cone, cost of new entry. So, so the theory is that when the market clears, it drives price down to cost. But, but this is a dance. It's meant to be a dance between marginal revenue and marginal cost. When these elements are fixed or constrained administratively, what we're doing is different than the theory upon which this was originally based. Also, as we mentioned before, there's a concern that social costs are being externalized so that the market could produce uh, what they call a tragedy of the commons. The commons is, you know, the park in the middle of the village, and since nobody owns it, maybe nobody takes care of it. So what's happening? States like Illinois and New York are acting with others thinking about it. Next slide, please. So, so that's the macro. Let's look at the micro. States have also added renewables to the mix for public policy reasons through things like RPS, Renewable Portfolio Standard. Renewables often come at zero short-run marginal cost. Because the markets were born out of the dispatch system, short-run marginal cost is their center of gravity. So when you pour in a bunch of zero short-run marginal cost stuff into a market like this, it tanks prices. Besides that, the market was oversupplied when we started adding all these renewables. And when you pour supply into a market that's oversupplied, you get a double whammy and that tanks prices further. So now you've got a couple of problems. The one problem is that your center of gravity in the market is the short run costs when what the economic theory says you need is long run marginal cost to signal entry and exit. And second, we are artificially depressing the short run marginal cost because we're jamming all this stuff in and jamming stuff in at a zero cost. So who gets hurt? Well, anyone with high fixed cost resources. They have the biggest difference between their short run and their long run cost. They've got to pay for all that capital. So what's happening is coal and nuclear, who provide value in the form of fuel diversity or other services, are, are getting sidelined or worse. So what is the FERC saying? Well, the good news is that we have a quorum at FERC now. Next slide, please. So in their main technical conference, um, FERC posed some big questions when it comes to price formation. They came up with five potential paths forward. So one is status quo. Let's keep on keep, keeping on. We, uh, we keep what you have. We apply the minimum offer price rule, the MOPR, on a case-by-case -case basis, and everything's fine. Second is limited or no MOPR. Dropping the MOPR is a little bit like a free-for-all, the wild, wild west. Just everybody duke it out. If you benefit from a subsidy, it's like putting a, a lead weight in your boxing glove. You're just going to knock more people out, and that's fine. If other people don't like it, let them get their own subsidy. Third is expand the MOPR. Use this as the weapon of choice versus subsidies. Fourth is accommodate state, state actions. Let the states do whatever they want, but adjust the market results to be what they would have been had the states put in no subsidies. In other words, use an administrative mechanism to set the main market clearing price. And then last is pull external, externalities into the market and price them in a fuel neutral way. So whatever attributes the state want, the states want, no problem, zero emissions, anything else, tell us what it is, we'll put it in the price and we'll let the market decide what, what's the best way to provide that. Next slide, please. So, so what's being done, we're seeing some themes. Pretty much everyone says the states should preserve their sovereignty uh, unless they run afoul of the dormant commerce clause. So what that says is the states can't mess with interstate commerce. So the states have sovereignty up until the point where they do something that, that damages interstate commerce. 
and violates the Commerce Clause. And, and the people in favor of markets, everyone wants the states to have their sovereignty and their public policy interests met. Some stakeholders say, you know, we can accommodate these state goals, but how do we know this isn't going to come back in a few years? Another issue is potential spillover effects between states with different priorities. Some states might want a uh, price on carbon, some might not. PJM has proposed some interesting ways to deal with that and, and have the market accommodate those differences. And market operators in general say we can tailor the market mechanisms to accommodate state-driven resource interests and monetize their impact, just tell us what they are. The states, they kind of sort of want centralized markets, but they're not sure they really trust them and they don't like what the markets are doing. And so they feel strongly both ways. So that's where we were when the Department of Energy and Rick Perry waded into the thick of things. Next slide, please. So DOE issues this uh, notice of proposed rulemaking, a NOPR, to compensate fuel secure, their words, fuel secure resources, uh, and DOE defines that as having a 90-day fuel supply on site, and they want to compensate them by making sure that they recover their costs. So this, um, the, the, the theory says that marginal revenue ought to equal marginal cost, but this is far different than the theory this would be a set cost rather than that dance we talked about earlier. So the DOE gave FERC a short time to act, and FERC said, fine, we'll take that short time frame. Air read under the statute, FERC, FERC technically is under DOE's umbrella, but air read under the statute is FERC is an independent agency, and so they can do one of three things. They can say, yes, we'll do what the DOE asked us to do. They can say, second thing they can do is they can say, yes, we'll do it, but we're recommending some changes. Or the third thing they can do is recommend it not be adopted. And since FERC has exclusive jurisdiction, they can say no thank you, and we think the no thank you should end things. So what has FERC done so far? Well, they posted on their website um, these uh, 30 questions, and they're getting a, a boatload of comments, which are in the trades every day. And so one possibility that occurs to us is that FERC would use these questions and the responses to them to perform the Claude Rains gambit. If you're a movie fan, in the movie Casablanca, Claude Rains is the prefect of police, and he closes Humphrey Bogart's cafe. And Humphrey is incensed. He says, on what grounds are you closing my cafe? And Claude Rains, prefect of police, says, shocked. I'm shocked to learn that gambling is going on here at which point the croupier stuffs a fistful of money into Claude Rains' hands because obviously he's been gambling. So what FERC might do is look at the comments and they might say, shocked. I'm shocked to see the DOE has not been real specific in what they've recommended and created more issues than their proposal solves, and therefore we're just going to fold it into our ongoing price uh, formation proceeding. Some of the comments have been pretty strong. PJM said, the NOPR does not correctly state the problem, nor propose a reasonable solution that meets the just and reasonable standard under the Federal Power Act. So other than DOE got the problem wrong, their solution isn't reasonable and is against the law, PJM thinks it's great. In, in marked contrast, Exelon commented just recently, uh, Secretary Perry commended Secretary Perry for focusing attention on the need to reform the energy markets and said, we want to see three things. First, we'd like to see PJM submit their price formation proposal. Second, we'd like all the RTOs to submit a grid vulnerability thing to the FERC. And third, we'd like the FERC to promise pinky square we won't do anything with the state actions on zero emissions credits. Bottom line, you've got a complicated economic problem that is difficult to resolve because the fundamentals are out of kilter. The market is run on short-run marginal cost. That's its center of gravity. It should have been on long-run marginal cost if we're trying to gain entry and exit price signals. But there's no way to change that now. There's too much embedded. It would be very disruptive to change it. So this is made worse by market actions that are increasing the pressure. And this is being resolved in a highly political, a highly public, and as you just heard, a highly contentious arena it will be very interesting to see where this lands, and I'm sure this will be in the trades in the coming months. So with that, 
Next slide, please. Thank you for staying with us and offering questions, and now we will field them. Greg Leitra will help us with this. And next slide. Greg, what's our first question? Well, Stuart, um, first question is for Paul. Um, are there, um, Paul, are there any examples where you see a movement toward controllable solar? So I think a, a great example is the Hawaiian electric companies. Uh, what they have done recently is earlier uh, last month in October, they rolled out what they call a renewable uh, dispatch uh, PPA. And so what they're, they're proposing in their new model PPA structure is that when a solar system signs this PPA, they will be able to dispatch the, the resource ahead of time. And what they intend to do with this is to actually ramp down or throttle back those systems and run them at partial capacity. And so if they need regulation, whether up or down, they would have that available on the system ahead of time. And this is coming about in Hawaii because the way their, their utility scale PPAs have worked historically is that uh, they curtail individuals by vintage. So some of the newer and most likely less expensive uh, renewable resources that have come on the system are the ones that get curtailed first. Um, and they, they're having some of those challenges because of the large uh, distributed resources that they have in, on the island islands. Um, and so there's, there's this is probably the first real concrete example of uh, a market or a PPA structure being changed to try to make solar, utility scale solar, more controllable. And in fact, they're actually having a, um, a webinar on Monday that Scott Madden is also participating in to describe that construct that they're, they're rolling out and it put forth before the commission as well. Um, so that, that's probably a great example to watch to see how that is received and actually implemented in the marketplace. Thanks, Paul. Uh, the next question is uh, for Kristen. Uh, Kristen, you talked a little bit about the uh, legislative developments in Illinois. And uh, the question comes in, um, what do you think will be the major challenges in implementing Illinois' uh, Future Energy Jobs Act? So as I mentioned, I think um, EMA laid a really good foundation, both from the perspective of grid infrastructure and um, in beginning to migrate the regulatory construct um, to support that infrastructure build out. Um, with FIJA, we're starting to see um, potentially a change to the regulatory construct. So up to this point, um, net energy metering has been in effect since I believe it's 2007, but a very small number of subscribers have um, signed up for it, like 13 megawatts on ComEd system. What we're, what we're going to start to see is more customers that sign up for net energy metering because of um, the carve out that we see. And FIJA has also put in place um, a path to migrate away from this construct. So they they have said that once um, net energy metering will be in place up to 5% of the peak load for the previous year, once the state hits 3%, they are mandated to begin a path to investigate valuing distributed energy resources both locationally and temporally on the grid. Um, this is an area that is being explored both in California and New York and New York has already um, issued its um, phase one value stack order, which is exceedingly complex um, and candidly is not being entirely well received by the solar community. So this is gonna be a place where Illinois has the opportunity to learn some lessons from what's happening elsewhere and um, maybe do some things based on those lessons. But I think that's gonna be at least one of the challenges of implementing CJ. Thank you. Um, Paul, uh, another question comes in. You mentioned uh, in your discussion signpost to monitor, uh, but what are the key milestones that you would expect to see as, uh, as we progress towards smart solar? So uh, I think there's maybe two that are, are noteworthy. Um, first is hitting and, and seeing controllable solar come onto the system. And so Hawaii might be a, a great place, as mentioned earlier, to watch. Also with California, with the pilot being done in California, um, seeing how they build in and, and view uh, the capabilities of solar and integrate that going down the road could also be a, a great place to watch. Uh, looking more long term when we move to smart utility scale solar, 
the, the key milestone there is probably when one of these resources competes and outbids uh, a natural gas plant and um, a, a peaker plant. And then more importantly, actually comes online and then performs as expected. So being able to deliver energy and capacity uh, when expected and needed and doing it successfully uh, as built. So we, we Scott Madden doesn't make a, a guesstimate to when that could come around, but um, uh, the CEO of NextEra, which develops projects like this, made a comment in 2015 that in his view at that time, uh, post 2020, we wouldn't be building any more natural gas peakers because they would they would be um, storage based. So, um, so it's unclear when we'll exactly get there, but I think that would be the the important milestone. Thanks, Paul. Um, another question for for Kristen, um, and uh, it's a little bit of a leading question. Uh, I'll, I'll start off. The, the the question starts. Infrastructure report card is D, which I assume means um, there's an annual, um, I think it's the American Society of Mechanical Engineers puts out a, its assessment of American infrastructure. So I, I think that's where that's coming from. So um, is it perceived then, according to uh, the question comes in, uh, is it perceived that the grid investment is low? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Um, so I, my initial response would be no, I don't think that grid investment is low, particularly given um, some of the numbers we looked at in transmission, you know, in, I mentioned $3.2 billion as part of EIMA. That would suggest that we are seeing um, both robust investment and very targeted investment in some cases. I, I would suggest that where we are with grid development is um, transmission may be challenged going forward, as I mentioned. But rather than replacing like for like as we see these grid modernization programs emerge, we're going to see like for better. Um, in terms of increased automation on the system, looking to implement optionality um, and the ability to integrate alternative resources into the distribution side. Um, so I, again, I think the, the grid is going to become capable of doing things that it wasn't before. And if you grade the grid today on what those future capabilities may be, no, it doesn't match up. But the flip side is that we have some time to get there. We just need to think very carefully about how to make those investments. Thanks, Kristen. Um, the uh, next question is for Stuart. Um, uh, New York and Illinois have passed zero emissions credits to, to benefit uh, nuclear, uh, the, the preservation of nuclear plants. What will happen with this in the courts, and uh, how long do you think it will take to be resolved? I was hoping for an easier question, Greg. So, um, that's a good question. But both New York and Illinois credit mechanisms have been challenged in court. State court challenges have generally upheld their legality, and an initial challenge in federal district court has, has been denied. Challengers, which include merchant generators with assets fired by stuff like natural gas, seek to invalidate the zero emissions credit mechanisms as being co contrary to the thing I was talking about before, the dormant commerce. Commerce Clause that says the states can't um, mess up or discriminate against interstate commerce, and, and to challenge the state's ability to put in the mechanisms, uh, saying that the Federal Power Act takes that away from them. What's at issue is whether the, the stuff they're doing is tethered to the wholesale market. So no one knows what tethered means. The court rulings have been extremely narrow, and when you listen to the oral arguments, the, mostly the judges are trying to understand this stuff, which is very confusing, and that's why they're issuing narrow rulings. There, there's sort of two views. You look at the New York, and you look at that $39 number, and you kind of say, this looks like a derivative financial contract on the wholesale price. That means it's tethered. On the other hand, some people say, this is the same as RPS. It's no different. It's, the states are already doing this now. It's fully within their purview. Uh, in the meantime, New York litigation is pending to the Federal Court of Appeals. Our best guess is that it goes to the U.S. Supreme Court, and it's probably not going to be resolved in 2017. Maybe there'll be an eight in the year in which it's resolved. The way things are going, maybe, maybe a nine. So nobody knows. So with that, next slide, please. So please let us wrap up. 
on behalf of Kristen and Paul and Greg and everyone at Scott Madden, um, we, uh, we really appreciate your attending and, and thank you. If you'd like to receive the full Scott Madden Energy Industry Update, please just click this link. And with that, let me turn it back over to PJ to, to uh, let me turn it back to PJ at Energy Central to close us out. Thank you, Stuart. And thank you, speakers. Great presentation. For our audience, we hope you've enjoyed today's discussion. As you log off, please take a moment to complete our survey and give us your feedback so we can continue to provide you with quality content. Thank you for attending. This concludes today's presentation.